As the wind and rain of Hurricane Maria whipped through the island of Puerto Rico on the 20th of September 2017, residents of Toa Baja hunkered down in their houses to brave the storm. Maria beat its full force against the coastal town, and a massive storm surge flooded Toa Baja, trapping thousands. In the aftermath, as the community picked up the pieces of shattered houses and mourned the eight dead drowned by the wrath of Maria, anger and resentment simmered. How could a storm supercharged by climate change do so much damage to an island and community that have done so little to cause the climate crisis? Why do those who contribute little to the climate crisis bear the brunt of its force? Today we'll unpack that question and more. Today, we reflect on climate debt, what it is, why it's so important, and how we can make sure those at the front lines of climate chaos don't have to brave the storm alone. This video was made possible by the people who support me on Patreon. Get early access to all my videos by becoming an OCC Patreon supporter. In 2010, a revolutionary proclamation was forming under the shadow of the Andes mountain range. 30,000 people representing peasant groups, leftist movements, and governments in the imperial periphery from over 100 countries converged on the Bolivian city of Cochabamba to carve a new people's conference that stood in opposition to the neoliberal capitalist politicking of the 2009 Copenhagen climate talks. The result of this Cochabamban conference, known as the World People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth, was a revolutionary document. A people's accord that shunned the failing capitalist mitigation strategies and set a course for a liberatory climate action plan that centered the right of Mother Earth and its people to a good and healthy life. Max Eil, author of A People's Green New Deal, calls this agreement our era's communist manifesto. And within this revolutionary proclamation lies a crucial section about climate debt. A concept first brought to the world stage in 1990 by non-governmental organizations and argued for by Fidel Castro at the 1992 Kyoto Conference. <laughs> y las tres cuartas partes de la energía que se produce en el mundo. Climate debt is the idea that those in the global north, or the imperial core, are not only responsible for the vast majority of emissions and ecological destruction that drives the climate crisis, but also that the climate crisis itself is derived from the extreme exploitation of people and extraction of resources by the global north in the global south. On top of all that, the climate crisis disproportionately affects the imperial periphery. So climate debt calls for reparations from countries in the imperial core to help countries still reeling from the trauma of colonization to adapt, mitigate, and face the harsh realities of climate chaos. According to the 2010 People's Agreement, climate debt includes emissions debts, meaning over-emitting countries must compensate for their historical emissions through intense carbon sequestration techniques, development debt, a transfer of patent-free clean technology to the imperial periphery to compensate for the imperialists' historical use of fossil fuels to build strong economies, adaptation debt, the payment for damages caused by a climate crisis fueled by the imperial core, and migration debt, meaning emissions-heavy countries must shelter and open their borders to climate migrants whose homes and livelihoods are shattered by climate change. Ultimately, the notion of climate debt emphasizes the inequality of the climate crisis. It shows us the stark reality that countries in the imperial core have benefited from the plunder of the atmosphere, land, and countries in the periphery for centuries and must now repay that debt that they have racked up. But who must pay and how much? With each new conference of parties, from Copenhagen to Paris, Bolivia, Venezuela, and other countries in the imperial periphery continue to push for some sort of climate debt compensation from the United States and Europe, and again and again, they are rebuffed. A response that stings, especially considering that 80% of fossil fuels are located in the periphery in countries like Bolivia and Iran, which means that the Global North's call for a phase-out of oil dependency would lead to massive 
massive economic and social displacement and chaos. So as countries like the United States enjoy infrastructure and economies built on the foundations of fossil fuels, they're simultaneously telling countries in the periphery without any technological or monetary compensation. To make matters worse, countries with some of the lowest emissions rates are usually the ones impacted the most. According to the African Development Bank, Sub-Saharan African countries account for 15% of the global population and just 2% of energy-related carbon dioxide emissions. Yet, they currently shoulder 50% of global adaptation costs. To put the sheer inequality of the Imperial Corps' hand in creating the climate crisis into perspective, Swedish professor Rickard Wallenus calculated that as of 2008, if Imperial Corps countries only used their fair share of emissions, they would have emitted just 15% of their current total historical emissions while the imperial periphery, which includes China, could have emitted 4.4% more. Essentially, the imperial core has vastly overshot their emissions, and they refuse to own up to the damage that it is causing across the world. And if you're looking for a dollar amount to put to this debt, Warlenos calculates that at a price of $50 per ton of carbon dioxide, the North's debt would be $37.3 trillion. But as Max Isle points out in his book, A People's Green New Deal, when you factor in the IPCC's carbon price to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius, that number balloons to a range of 112 to $448 trillion. That is a staggering debt, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. Those dollar amounts only recognize emissions and fail to capture the damage of centuries of colonialist plunder, disasters supercharged by climate change, and imperialist wars. As Nicola Bollard writes in an article for the Transnational Institute, the real debt cannot be calculated. It is much more than a number or money. Climate debt symbolizes 500 years of unequal relations between North and South, between rich and poor, between exploiters and exploited. So to truly repay the climate debt, the global North needs to do a lot more than hand over money. It needs to reconcile with the exploitative reality of its colonialist, imperialist, and capitalist pursuits. Climate debt, at its root, attempts to address the inequality between the imperial periphery and the core, a chasm of inequality so wide that no dollar amount can come close to closing the gap. This is why large-scale change both from within imperial countries like the US and without are essential to truly repaying the climate debt. This looks like sharing patent-free, clean technologies with all countries and dissolving borders for climate migrants whose lives are shattered by climate chaos, both of which are argued for in the Cochabamba People's Agreement. But these are just smaller steps in a much broader picture. Yes, the Imperial Corps must pay their climate debt, but part of that ensures that we shatter the historic inequality forced onto the South by the North in the form of indiscriminate resource extraction, military coups, and all-out country-shattering wars, so that no new debt is accrued. This requires massive transformation within imperialist countries. It means demilitarization on an unprecedented scale. It means decolonization of the global south. And for settler colonial states like the US, it means decolonization inside of its borders as well. But while we struggle for those futures, countries in the periphery are demanding monetary compensation to tide them over while global capitalism still reigns. Bolivia, for example, alongside the knowledge transfer of sustainable technologies, demanded an annual payment amounting to 6% of each developed country's gross national product to the global periphery in order to manage adaptation, mitigation, and capacity costs. While 6% might seem like a lot, the true economic and social damage that the North has sown across the global South amounts to much more. At the end of the day, climate debt is an essential tool in our climate action arsenal because it reveals the current exploitative relationship between the imperial core and periphery. And it shows us that in order to have any hope of reversing the extensive chaos of climate change, the core needs to reconcile with its violent, dirty, oil-fueled past and join the rest of the world to build a more just and regenerative future.
Unfortunately, videos like these, while very important, do terribly with the YouTube algorithm and sponsors don't want to touch them. But there is a way you can help. Becoming an OCC Patreon supporter helps our changing climate stay afloat and independent. As an OCC patron, you'll not only gain early access to videos, but also special behind the scenes updates and a members only Discord channel. In addition, each month, my supporters vote on an environmental group that I then donate a portion of my monthly revenue to. Patreon supporters are the financial backbone of the Our Changing Climate operation. Without them, I wouldn't be able to take creative risks and dive into difficult topics. So if you want to help keep this channel alive or are feeling generous, head over over to patreon.com slash rchangingclimate or use the link in the description and become an OCC patron. If you're not interested or aren't financially able to, then no worries. You can help the channel out by subscribing, liking the video, and commenting. I hope you all enjoyed the video and I will see you in two weeks.